It's now my absolute pleasure to introduce to everybody Dr. John Day. He is an adjunct senior research fellow with the ARC Centre for Coral Reef Studies, James Cook University. He is a former director of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority and was involved in many aspects of planning and managing the Great Barrier Reef. He has experience in biodiversity conservation, park planning, world heritage, indigenous partnerships, reef rezoning, and commencing the first Great Barrier Reef Outlook Report. And as Anne Landman says, he's every bit as good as David Attenborough. So looking forward to hearing from you, John Day. Welcome. I spent most of my career, as Sally said, working in the Great Barrier Reef. Um, I started off in 1986. I retired in 2014. I want to talk about acknowledging the traditional owners at the start, and I hope my um, slides aren't on uh, automatic uh, forward. But yes, I do also want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the, of the reef, the elders past and present. Um, for those of you who aren't quite sure about the reef and the size, I think most of us know where it is on the northeast coast of Australia, but perhaps people don't recognise we're talking about an area that's 344,000 square kilometres. If we've got those little globes down the bottom, you can see that it's, many, it's bigger than many countries in the world. So when I go and talk, uh, luckily I used to go to North America, our US colleagues were amazed that it would stretch from the Mexican border all the way out to the Canadian border. It covers 14 degrees of latitude, so it's a huge area. It's not the world's biggest marine protected area, but it's probably one of the best known. Um, you may or may not be aware that there's both the Queensland and the federal governments involved in managing it. So it's quite a complex management arrangement. Um, and I should also add there are many others who help with management, including traditional owners, building on what our two previous speakers have talked about. The primary piece of legislation we use is a thing called the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Act. But I stress that's only one of many, many pieces of legislation. I mentioned how the state of Queensland worked with us. And there are some activities conducted separately by the state, but there are also many activities conducted in a joint way. And so fisheries, for example, occurring throughout the marine park is largely managed by the state, but under a framework developed by the Commonwealth. And so we have also what we call joint permits and complementary management. And so if you're in a boat, it doesn't matter where you are in the wet bits of the marine park, you don't have to know whether you're in the state marine park or the federal marine park because the complementary approach means the laws are the same. Most people think of the Great Barrier Reef as being about corals, and corals were the reason it was declared, the threat to the, the reef up in the uh, area around Ellison Reef up north. We've, it's made up of about 3,000 separate reefs spread, spreading, as uh, we just heard from Myri, right up in the Torres Strait, coming down uh, almost to Bundaberg. The northern boundary of the park stops at the tip of Cape York. So those northern reefs that uh, Mario mentioned are not actually part of the marine park. But I also want to stress that reefs only make up about 10% of the entire world heritage area. It actually might, might now be a slightly larger amount because we're now mapping a lot of deeper reef areas that we previously didn't know. But I also want to talk about some of the other important uh, habitats. And many of you, we've heard uh, Mari talk about seagrass and others. Um, the interreefal areas are all connected, as we've heard from previous speakers. So there's lots of interreefal areas that are important. The islands, there's over a thousand islands within the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area, and the waters around them, as I said, are largely managed by the state of Queensland. But these are a really important part of the overall World Heritage Area. And then we've got the deep water areas. Over uh, about one third of the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area is actually really deep waters outside the Great Barrier Reef outer edge. So the continental slope and the deep oceanic waters. So all these different areas make up the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area. The act was passed in 1975 and over the years it's been amended. And today the object of the act, the quite clear primary object says the long-term protection and conservation of the environment, biodiversity and heritage values of the region. Now that's a, a really powerful major object the Act then goes on to say, so far as consistent with the main object, allow for ecologically sustainable use of the region and various other objects. But to have this clear priority, I think is really important. 
sometimes some of our political masters forget that we have a hierarchy of, of objects, but I think it's really powerful to have this in our legislation. The Great Barrier Reef has always been recognised as a multiple use area, and that means all reasonable activities are allowed under certain conditions in certain zones. So many people are amazed to hear that we have, for example, bottom trawling in some areas, or that we allow defence training using high explosives in very small areas, or that we allow works including dredging. These sort of things are appropriate as long as they're well managed and done sustainably. And in such a large area, which is, as I said, is bigger than countries, you've got to have things like ports. You cannot, you know, Queensland could not exist without ports. What we have to do is ensure the works that work with those ports are sustainable. Over the years, the challenges facing us as managers has varied. So in the 1970s, before the park was declared, there was the threat of mine stone, limestone mining and oil drilling. And the Act came into effect in 1975. In the 80s, we were worried about things like crown of thorns and tourism booming. In the 90s, we started getting worried about the threats to biodiversity and trawling. But today, the issues are really about climate change and water quality, coastal development and fishing. And climate change is really the number one issue that comes through loud and clear. And I'll talk more about that later. Every five years in the Great Barrier Reef, the agency is required by law to produce an outlook report. This is a really very comprehensive, but easy to read report. And if you've never had a chance to look at it, I'd encourage you to do so on the web. The first one came out in 2009, five years later, 2014, both the conclusions of those outlook reports gave a poor outlook for the Great Barrier Reef. And people said, how could this be done? A government agency saying the outlook is poor. The reality is the evidence that's set out in the outlook reports could give no other sort of long-term outlook. In 2019, we had the next report and people were shocked again to see that the current or the most recent report has actually downgraded the outlook to very poor. And again, this is because the evidence is so clear. The sort of um, executive summary says, without additional local, national and global action on the greatest threats, the overall outlook for the GBR ecosystem will remain very poor with continuing consequences for its heritage values also. The window of opportunity to improve the reef's long-term future is now. For the GBR to remain resilient and maintain its myriad of values, society must play a pivotal and urgent role in mitigating impacts and adapting to change. So I think that uh, feeds nicely into what the FEN um, session is about today. I want to quickly talk about the outlook report because it really is the way that the authority talks about the threats facing the reef and what they're doing in the future. In the uh, report, there's a thing called a risk matrix, and it talks about 45 threats, which is a huge thing. 19 of these threats are region-wide, and you'll notice the colour coding, the very high risks of that purpley colour, high risks, red, etc. 26 of the threats are local or regional scale, and it's scary, but all but two of these 45 threats are actually happening now. Now, the other advantage of this risk matrix approach is it talks about, across the top, the likelihood of these threats. So on the left-hand side, are they rare? And as you move across towards the right, they're becoming almost certain. And up the right-hand side, we have the consequence. So down the bottom, it's an insignificant consequence. And up the top right-hand corner, catastrophic. So things in the top right are almost certain to occur and will have catastrophic impacts. If we look at climate change, which is the number one threat facing the reef, there are five key risks, and I won't go through them in detail, but you can see under the black dotted line, the names of acidification, sea temperature increase, altered weather patterns, sea level rise, and then as a high risk, altered ocean currents. You can see from those photos below what bleached coral looks like compared to a healthy coral. And you've probably heard about some of the things that have led to the recent threats, the back-to-back -back bleaching in 2016 and 2017 which had a huge impact and led to things like these sort of maps of coral bleaching across those back-to-back uh, -back years and then in 2020. Virtually the entire Great Barrier Reef had some level of bleaching. Now today we're getting recovery, but some areas were so badly damaged, we're not gonna see recovery for a long time. The reality is that corals are reasonably resilient if the pressures are taken off them, but they can take up to 10 or even more years to recover. 
And when we have back-to-back -back leasing on top of all the other pressures, these areas just don't have a chance to recover adequately. So we're also seeing a change in uh, the types of species. The second major group of threats is water quality. And you'll see here eight risks. The two photos, I think, really paint a, a very dire picture. The top one talks about a river plume coming out of one of the rivers, and you can see the sediment being carried out. The bottom photo hasn't been color touched at all. That's the light showing a nutrient plume going out across the reef. So these plumes from reefs and from major water uh, runoff events can go way offshore, way out to sea and actually impact reefs as well as seagrass and other interreefal areas. So we've got eight major risks down the uh, list there, nutrients, sediments, uh, outbreaks of crown of thorn starfish, modifying coastal habitats, pesticide. These are all major, major risks and the government is spending a lot of money to try and address them. Every uh, couple of years, the government puts out a report card and I should have put in the 2019 one, but the reality of 2019 one is still getting an overall uh, rating of a D, which is pretty sad. Um, the government is not meeting its own targets that they set in what they call the Reef 2050 plan. So this one little page here, you can see, well, maybe your card might be too small, I apologise, but the ratings for various different types of water quality issues. And whilst there's some A ratings, there's an awful lot of Ds and Es. And the overall rating for the entire Great Barrier Reef, if you, if you look down the catchments, are uh, Ds and Cs and overall D. This is not great for a World Heritage Area. The next major impact I want to talk about is unsustainable coastal development. And the Outlook report lists eight major risks, risks here. The top two very high risks are modifying the coastal habitat and sediment runoff. The little images in the top, uh, the two adjacent, are actually an aerial shot of Curtis Island, where the LNG gas plants were built in uh, recent decades. And you can see in the right-hand top corner in the red um, oval, the area that's being cleared to make the LNG plants. And that's a, a, an aerial shot of it in the lower um, photo. On, also in that uh, top right-hand corner, you can see the area that's been reclaimed in the World Heritage Area. In my view, totally inappropriate to take World Heritage Area and reclaim it for port activities. The fourth one I wanna talk about is unsustainable fishing impacts. And you can see here 10 different risks that are talked about when it comes to fishing. Illegal fishing and poaching, catching species of conservation concern like dugong and turtle, extracting topwater predators and having an impact on the food chain, discarding catch, um, extracting from spawning aggregations, disease, et cetera, et cetera. These are a, a whole range of fisheries impacts. And again, whilst uh, governments are working to address these, they are still having an impact on the reef. I want to quickly talk about how things have changed. So here's the matrix from the 2009 Outlook Report. And if you look um, at the very high risk in that top right-hand corner, there were three listed as almost certain of major consequence. If we jump to the 2019 report and look at that same top quadrant, today there are eight high, very high risks in that same almost certain major consequence. So this is a bit scary that even with the amount of effort and money and resources and passion about the reef we're still not getting on top of. And this is highlighted in this outlook report that I mentioned earlier. I want to stress, this isn't just the Great Barrier Reef. These are the same issues facing virtually all coastal marine areas around the world. Climate change is really the number one issue, but it's not the only issue. And so areas that are being uh, impacted by water quality, the problems of coastal development, fishing, increasing shipping and pollution, increasing recreational or, or tourism use on top of climate change, that's the real problem. So the real issue is actually the cumulative impacts. So we can't just point a finger at one alone. We have to work on many, many fronts. And climate change being a global issue is probably one of the hardest ones to address. So what we need to do is actually work on some of those other ones like water quality and coastal development and try and reduce the pressure to allow the reef to have better resilience to cope with climate change. So what's the future for the reef? I have to stress, unfortunately, that it is under unprecedented pressure today. And those pressures are both natural and man-made. As I just said, the biggest threat is the cumulative pressures of many, many things, both direct and indirect. And sadly, many of those pressures are likely to increase. 
We are working to address many of them, and the government is spending, as I said, a large amount of money to try and address them, but many of the other pressures are also increasing. So there's a need for the managers, and this isn't just Great Barrier Reef, this is state agencies, federal agencies, um, local communities, traditional owners, to pr prioritise their available resources to respond to these pressures. I haven't really got time today, and maybe in questions we can come back to this, but the Great Barrier Reef is a World Heritage Area. And as many of you will be aware, just recently the uh, World Heritage Committee met and they discussed whether the Great Barrier Reef should be listed as World Heritage in Danger. Now, it missed out on getting that label at the last meeting. It could still be listed in danger. My perspective, though, is that World Heritage in Danger is certainly going to raise the international profile, but it's not going to fix the problem. So I don't know if World Heritage in Danger is the best tool to deal with the issue, but I do recognise that World Heritage in Danger will increase global um, understanding of the concern, but I think that concern is already out there. The world is aware of you know, what's been happening with the bleaching. The world is aware that the reef is under pressure. So I'll leave it there. I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh, sorry, before I want to finish, though, I want to finish on a positive note. Despite all these pressures, the Great Barrier Reef is still one of the best. We, we are lucky. We have some of the best uh, management and scientists, uh, marine scientists around, working together to, for protection of the reef. So what I unfortunately says is that many of the other places in the world are in an even worse condition. So we are lucky. It's still one of the best areas, but I stress it's under a lot of pressure. So I'll leave it there. Happy to take questions. Thank you.